you. Thank you for that. We'll start at the beginning. Born 1954, Ontario. I don't Canada. recall. More or less. Um, not far from Niagara Falls. That's right, yeah. Actually quite a bit north, and it was uh, probably close to the Arctic Circle. We moved to Niagara Falls when I was, uh, I think, two, two and a half. So my first memories are from, are from there. So the ultimate special effects right there on your doorstep. Absolutely. And I could hear the thunder of the falls just faintly muted um, at all times, 24 hours a day. So, you know, the water on the brain thing has always sort of occurred to me as a result of that. <laughs> and the water obviously is going to recur during the <sighs> evening here as well. Mm -hmm. So if you were born in 54, it would have been mid-60s or so probably by the time you were really aware of cinema, is that right? I think when I was in the, the, the third grade or so, when I was, uh, whatever that is, seven-ish, uh, I saw uh, Mysterious Island, a Ray Harryhausen film with sort of fantastic creature effects in it and really pretty mind-blowing stuff in its day. And uh, my, I recall that my response to that was to draw. Whenever I saw something that was a, a, that was a strong, made a strong impression on me, I had to draw, but I wouldn't just draw the thing itself. I would start to embellish and create my own stories around it. And so there, there were these sort of trigger points in the Harryhausen films and you know, then you know, that whole slew of sci-fi B-movies that, that came. And then 2001 was a seminal you know, kind of moment in the late 60s, 68. It was, uh, it was not like anything I'd, I'd seen before. And it, that was the trigger point for me in, in, in wanting to emulate technique. So started making little models and lighting them in a very contrasty style against a black background and shooting them with you know, my dad's uh, uh, Super 8 camera. And then a friend of mine had a camera that could do single frame. So then we started doing animation. And one thing sort of led to another, I guess. Because your father was a scientist. He was an engineer. Engineer. Uh, and then you, you studied physics and English, I think, at college, but right, you, although right. you moved to California. Physics first then. and then switched to English. But yeah. did you think that, do you still think of yourself? Or did you think you approach things in a scientific way? I'm pretty analytical. The thing, I was thinking about this the other day, and you know, I, was, I was sitting at a, a round table of, of directors, and everybody said, yeah, you've got to go with your gut, and you've got to have instinct, and your decision should be instinctual. I actually think that that's a slight simplification of the directing process. I think it's a very analytical process. Uh, even on, on Avatar, um, I remember literally having a discussion with the editor saying, okay, look, in this battle sequence, every single time we've improved the battle, we've done it by putting like with like, putting the attack with the attack, the retreat with the retreat, and grouping things that way. Well, that's a very analytical kind of approach. And I realize that it's a balance between analysis and just pure gut instinct. So you worked, as a, you worked as art director for Roger Corman by 1980 um, on uh, Battle Beyond the Stars, mm. so science fiction already right there from the beginning. Well, there was a definite, you know, this was right after Star Wars and even before Empire Strikes Back, and Roger was getting in there quickly, yeah. striking while the iron was hot. And I, I, got, I got a job as a model builder. I was, I was, model builder, I was working in the model shop, and uh, he, he sort of came in and said, well, you haven't, you haven't designed the main character's ship. And, and, and uh, everybody st stood there stunned. And it sort of looked like it was going to be a quick bake-off to see who could, who could come up with desi design quickly enough. So everybody started drawing something. And I figured it's a Roger Corman film. The, the main character's ship is a female personality, kind of like Hal 9000, only sexy, right? I thought, OK, I'm going to draw a spaceship with tits. <laughs> and, and that was my play. And Roger came through the next day, and he said, what is this? I said, it's a spaceship with tits, Roger. And he says, you've got the job. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it worked. <laughs> But so within just four years of that, you were actually directing your own big feature yeah, itself. Yeah, things, things happen fast. Terminator. Now, is it true that you thought of the theme or that the theme of Terminator came to you in a dream? It wasn't so much a theme as a kind of seminal image. I was, I was, I was in Rome. I was broke. I, I, had a, I had a high fever. And I was just having these, these weird dreams. And, and uh, I had this image of this kind of chrome skeleton, you know, death image coming out of a fire, kind of um, phoenix-like. And uh, I just got up and sketched it. And then around the nucleus of that, I started to, started to create a story and sort of backfill. OK, what is it? Where did it come from? Uh, you know, who's it after? And, and it all sort of fell into place fairly quickly. Do you think that science fiction should always have underlying ideas, you know, really quite strong themes there? And, and if so, beyond this idea of, of rage and you know, <laughs> getting the world to work the, your way, what is it in Terminator? 
it's not really about machines from the future. It's, it's sort of about our relationship with technology, but it's, all, it's, it's, it's really kind of about how, how our, our human potential for dehumanization ourselves. You, you see, you see uh, cops as examples. And then, you know, the other idea that, that uh, uh, not to trust technology and even not to trust the fabric of reality because by the second film, you've got this woman who's gone, gone crazy knowing that the that the world is a completely fragile place and it's all an illusion. It can all be torn away by by this uh, by this nuclear war. And I was sort of playing with that in the in the first film as well. That there's this war. It hasn't happened yet. But if you know that, everything changes and all your priorities change. Um, you know, ideas like that. And I think that comes from being a kid in the '60s. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis clearly having these kind of fallout shelter. How to make a fallout shelter in your house like that would do any good. You know. <laughs> so the next place you go is into outer space with aliens. Yeah. Now, of course, Ridley Scott had already done Alien, the first one, and set quite a strong pattern there. So how much of a challenge was it to follow on? Well, look, it, it, was, it was kind of um, interesting because everybody was advising me not to do the film because Ridley Scott's a tough act to follow, and, and it just seemed like if, if, uh, if there was anything good in the film that I made, it would be attributed back to the source material, and if there was anything, you know, anything bad would be attributed to me. And so it seemed like a no-win scenario, but I was such a geek fan still, even at that point, even after having made Terminator, that I just wanted to make the movie. It just seemed like, seemed really cool. So Sigourney seemed like, uh, you know, uh, she, would, she would make a, an amazing kind of evolved Ripley, because I took her forward with the, with the kind of the post-traumatic stress syndrome kind of after effects of her first experience in, in the script that I wrote. And it just seemed like it was a, a, a really cool opportunity, and I didn't want to pass it up. Do you feel that you took it in a different direction then? I mean, technically as well. Yeah, so. clearly. I mean, um, it was such, such an amazing film, but I thought, all right, fine, what do, what do I do? I do? I do action. You know, if, if people know me from Terminator, there's got to be a through line from that. So I wanted to do some really kinetic, some, some kinetic scenes. And the second you put a kineticism into, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the backdrop of, of, you know, Ridley's uh, design, now you've got a whole different film. It's going to be much more of a roller coaster ride, much more of an action picture, less of a horror film. To what extent, um, with this film and with the next film, The Abyss, did technical possibilities drive what you were trying to do? I was always trying to trying to, to push. You know, I mean, look, I, I read avidly. I was a big fan of all the of all the techniques of prosthetic and appliance makeup and and uh, visual effects and if you could cheat them and use sort of foreground miniatures and things like that which we did on aliens I knew all the old cheats the the Schuftan shots and the glass paintings and all that and I used to love it when the when the effects department of a major studio was called the trick department you know because they were just tricks they were tricks to the eye they were they were trompe l'oeil and things like that so all the effects in in aliens are, are very crude by, by present standards, very simple and straightforward. Even the Alien Queen was, was just operated by people. It wasn't even hydraulic. Uh, there were off-camera puppeteers, and there were two guys inside the body of the thing operating the arms and, you know, and all that. But between um, Aliens and the Abyss, you're starting to get that shift, aren't you? And, with, and computer generation right. is coming in, in a big way. We had all sorts of wild ideas, like projecting uh, high-speed photography of water onto uh, claymation and animating it frame by frame, all kinds of wacky stuff like that. Some of it probably would have worked just fine, just, you know, just, uh, just fine in the, in, the, uh, in the end. But it was proposed to me that we try it with uh, computer-generated animation. I knew nothing about that. Um, but uh, so I said, all right, show me a test. Show me something that, that, you know, that looks even remotely like this. And two different companies, uh, one was ILM with Dennis Muir and the other one was Kleiser Walzak, uh, both produced a test and neither one of them really looked that good. But one had the surface texture and the other one had the refraction and the movement. And I thought, if you put that with that, you could get, you could maybe do something really interesting. So we kind of took this big leap of faith and went with uh, the computer graphics and I, and I went with, uh, with Dennis Muirin at, at ILM and he and I became friends over the subsequent years and he, he worked on, on Terminator 2, of course, too, which is the, the natural through line of that, of that process. And it's really interesting the way that um, computer generation evolves. That so it was water at that stage and mm -hmm. subsequently obviously it's you know, being sand or fur yes, or right, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then you suddenly find that the whole crop of films will come out at that time 
where everybody's showing that they can do this. But yes. this, presumably, the abyss was really early on in, in the whole water thing. Yeah, I can place it exactly. There was a movie called Young Sherlock Holmes that had a, a, a CG character, the stained glass knight, but he was a hard surface model and he was just these floating panes of glass. But the first time anybody had seen a soft surface model, and especially a human face that was animated, and, you know, Mary Elizabeth's. Uh, face uh, when on on the pseudopod sticks out her tongue, and so there's all it, it just sort of took it up to to a higher level. But just to remind people uh, again for the setup for the abyss, it's a nuclear sub goes down in mysterious mm -hmm. circumstances, and then this crew are, are brought in to, to salvage it, uh, to salvage the wreck. Uh, but there's great potential for tension within the crew. That stuff is so expensive that uh, the the CG you can see it's like all reaction shots. You know, when the pseudopod comes into the room, one character reacts, then another, then another, then another, then another, then another. Then another. <laughs> Finally, we cut back to the thing, you know. I think there's probably 14 or 15 shots in the whole sequence. They took nine months to do. And I think in the last two months of Avatar, uh, in post-production in Avatar, before final delivery, uh, we had a 1,000 shots come in. So obviously the abyss was a very demanding shoot. I mean, you, you were actually filming, we saw a little bit there, in a not yet commissioned nuclear facility. So we're in a, what would have been the containment vessel of a, of a nuclear reactor. And uh, it was a big tank that <laughs> held, I think, seven million gallons. But I mean, also I, discussions with the studio about the length of the film, I think. Does that always happen? Well, that was, yeah, I always believe that to create fantasy with a sense of reality, you have to embellish it with a lot of, a lot of detail. And it's the, it's the small detail that makes it feel real to people. And so that whole idea of, of the three-hour film, which you, you said, I'm a, I understand that you feel it needs the detail and the space, but, but do you know whether the audience is like that? The only sort of reference point we had back in those days was Dances with Wolves, which was, you know, which won Best Picture, and it was three hours and ten minutes. But uh, historically, films that length, it just didn't work. And it wasn't until Titanic that I actually, we actually had a film that we believed worked at that length. And still everybody was nervous about it, and exhibitors said it wouldn't work, and we got a lot of pushback from the exhibition community, but we, we went with it anyway. And so Titanic begins really way back when you, di diving, as you do a lot, <laughs> you yeah. go down to the, the wreck of the Titanic and shoot some documentary for you. Yeah, I mean, it really starts with me being a scuba diver and loving wreck diving and so on and, and uh, exploring wrecks and thinking, well, what's the ultimate shipwreck, the Titanic? And, and uh, uh, you know, a presentation I made to, to Fox was, was very simple. I, I walked in with Ken Marshall's beautiful book of paintings of the Titanic, wrapped it open on, on Peter Chernin's coffee table in his, in his office, and there's a big double you know, uh, page painting of the ship sinking with all the lifeboats and the distress players going off and said, Romeo and Juliet on the Titanic. That was it. And uh, seriously, I mean, it was like, actually, it was my best pitch, if you think about it. Cause <laughs> I'm, I'm usually pretty terrible at pitching. Um, but, but, you know, my real goal was to actually go dive the shipwreck. Making the movie was kind of secondary in my mind at that point. <laughs> and people make decisions for strange reasons, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, and, and my, my pitch on that was a, uh, had to be a little more detailed. I said, look, we, you know, I don't, I'd written the script at that point. And I said, um, you know, we've got to do this whole opening where they're exploring the Titanic and they find the diamond. So we're going to have all of these shots of the, of the ship. Now, we can either do them with elaborate models and, and motion control shots and CG and all that, which will cost X amount of money, or we can spend, you know, X plus 30 percent and actually go shoot it at the, at the real wreck. And it'll be a, a publicity coup, and you can basically take it from the marketing budget, which actually proved to be the case. I think, I think the amount of, uh, of uh, free media that we got off of having actually dived to the wreck was, uh, was pretty awesome and really helped the uh, public awareness of the film right before the release. So with this sort of tripartite thing of the historical detail and obviously the spectacular effects and this very strong emotional story, mm -hmm. did you approach Titanic in a different way? Uh, well, I did a lot more research. I mean, you know, these other films were, were sort of <laughs> fantasy science fiction. I didn't need a lot of, of uh, technical veracity or, or historical veracity to it. But with Titanic, I approached it very differently. I, you know, I, I, I read everything I could read. I, I created a, an extremely detailed timeline of the, of the ship's few days and a, and a very detailed timeline of the, of the last night of its life. And, um, and I worked within that to write the script. And then I, I, I you know, 
got in some historical experts to sort of analyze what I'd written and comment on it, and I adjusted it. You know, we, we wanted this to be a definitive uh, visualization of, of this, this moment in history as if you'd gone back in a time machine and, and, and shot it. But then, of course, overlaid and woven through that is this, uh, this love story. I did read something once that, that you said that you felt Titanic had pushed to the limit um, how much time you can spend on character in mainstream filmmaking. I suppose what I was talking about is that, is that it was a three hour and 15 minute movie and, and by the time the credits are rolling on, on the majority of films, nothing's pretty much happened except that, you know, when he saves her here and then they do a little spitting over the railing, he does a little drawing, you know, they fall in love, they run around the ship, you know, I mean, it's pretty, it's like it's really nothing but character and, 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 uh, and, the, and the development of a relationship for two hours. Then a whole bunch of bad stuff happens which structurally is a very strange form. You know, it's a very strange architecture for a movie, but it worked, because the only way all that, all that uh, disaster stuff later m meant anything to you as an audience was because you cared about them. And I don't think the film could have sustained that if it wasn't, it, if, if you didn't know what was gonna happen, if there wasn't in the back of your mind this sort of ticking clock and this sense of doom over the whole, over the whole thing, the innocence of that, the joyfulness of that, of their relationship, and just simply spending time on that wouldn't have worked. And of course, as we know, it all worked out awfully well in the end. So at that point, that must have been, when you came to consider the next thing, somewhat inhibiting. What happened after Titanic was, and, and bear in mind that I made the movie because I wanted to dive to the wreck. I basically got hooked on deep ocean exploration. And there was a thrill in that that was greater than the glitz of a red carpet, uh, winning an Academy Award. These were all, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't mean to diminish them. They're, they're wonderful experiences, but there was something uh, very uh, real uh, uh, and yet in a, in a science fiction fantasy kind of way about exploring inner space and getting to actually do that. I always wanted to go to space, couldn't do that, but I could go to the, to the bottom of the ocean. So, you know, I wound up working with the, with the, the Russian submersibles on uh, six subsequent uh, uh, deep ocean expeditions over a five year period, made four documentary films in that time. I was justified it to myself that I was perfecting the 3D technique to do a, to do a 3D movie in the future. And in fact, that was true. We were, we were doing that, but also just having a, a, an amazing time. And raising a family, having children, I knew that the, that the kind of commitment that I made to a movie didn't allow me to have any free time. I would just work seven days a week and it was completely consuming. And I wasn't willing to do that either. So everything just kind of worked out the way it was meant to work out from my perspective. From the external view, it, it seems like I just sort of went away and then came back with Avatar. Uh, but in fact, the idea for Avatar, I think you'd had a long time back, prior, hadn't yeah, you? Yeah. Um, but it was a question of the technique. So what, the idea yes. was the, the 3D one, or the idea was the, you know, the, the virtual reality? Yeah, it was the virtual re reality yeah. piece that, that, that wasn't there. The 3D we had, we, we had worked out even when we started Avatar. Back in 95, I, ro I wrote Avatar Partially because, you know, it's something I'd always wanted to do. It was a real dream project, a, a fantasy story taking place on another planet with all these cool creatures. It was going to be like the ultimate creature movie, you know. And uh, just the design alone was what, it, what attracted me to the, to the project. But um, it, it just didn't seem like, you know, and then, and then I shot Titanic. And by after Titanic, my, my company, Digital Domain, was supposed to have all the answers for how to make this movie. I'd given them two years, after all. And when I came, when I came back, they, they, they still said, you know, this isn't going to happen without a ridiculous amount of money and time. Uh, so then when it looked like the, the CG was beginning to mature enough that we could make Avatar if we were willing to sort of push it a little bit to the next level, then we started the film in, in, uh, in 05. And, you know, we still had two years of research and development to, to develop our, our uh, performance capture pipeline up to, to our level where we thought that the characters would be fully believable. And this is where you use um, a head rig, basically, yeah, head and, rig. and instead of using the little sensor things which people had used in performance capture. Right. Well, the mistake they'd been making previously is they put marker dots all over the body and they'd capture the body motion, but they'd use the same marker dot or, or you know, uh, these little spherical markers. They'd glue them all over the actor's face. Well, you know, you've sort of got 200-some muscles in your body. Half of them are in your face. So there's a whole kind of order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude, 
more information, more data that's required about the face to actually make it, to, to make it real. And of course, they weren't getting anything from the eyeballs themselves, the eye movement, because they weren't gluing markers on the people's eyes, at least not that I ever heard of. So, so we decided to take a completely different approach, which was to uh, create a head rig. The idea was that we would photograph the face in a, in a close-up 100% of the time while the actor worked, but not just a close-up sort of from a, a camera off somewhere, but, but locked to the head so that it was essentially nulled out and so that the, that, that data could be, could be uh, put into the computer and then you know, rates of change and edges and so on, optical flow, could be used to, to, to track all the features of the face as if they were markers. So in, essence, in essence, a kind of infinite marker set. I've got one um, final the, question for yeah. you, which is that obviously Avatar is a great showcase for all this groundbreaking new technology, as yeah. you've done before. Yeah. And we already know, although you may not say exactly what your next project is, that you're thinking ahead, because that's how you work. Sure. So what's the next big thing in cinema, then? Well, I mean, for me, uh, you know, Avatar was such an experimental process. And I know that we made, you know, we, went, we made a lot of mistakes. We went down some blind alleys, and, and, and we meandered a bit, and it took us a lot to kind of, kind of work out exactly how to, how to do everything. I think the next big challenge, honestly, is, is, is a process challenge for me. It's a challenge of being able to get the same end result as Avatar in less time, more efficiently, for, for, for less money. But the idea of real in cinema, as in, you know, because Pandora It's meaningless is... now. Exactly. The idea of what's real. I think, you know, the lines will just continue to blur between, between CG and, and, and photography a until it becomes, becomes meaningless. The, you know, whether you, whether you capture something with a lens or you use, um, you, you use uh, imaginary photons in CG, the rules of lighting are the same. I mean, when, you, know, you, you know, if you want sunlight, you create sunlight. You either do it with a, with a xenon light or, or, or 12K HMI, or you do it with, uh, with a sun source in, in a global illumination in a, in a CG scene file. It's the same thing. You have to imagine the sunlight. In neither case, usually, is it actually sunlight. Uh, you know, because, I mean, uh, all, all cinematography is, is, a, is a form of artifice anyway, masquerading as reality. And, and the CG does the same thing. I just think it's going to become more seamless as we go along and less relevant to even sort of dissect it or deconstruct it into, into what its component parts are. James Cameron, it's been a pleasure to talk to you about your life and pictures. Thank you very much for being here.